So I'm really, really delighted to welcome Seth Tibbet to the podcast. Now, Seth is the founder of one of the longest running and most loved and established vegan brands, Tuferki. Hello, Seth. Good morning. I mean, afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for being with us. Um, yeah. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm over here in my home. I've been sheltering in place for the last month and I'm in Trout Lake, Washington, which is on the west coast of the U.S., up in the mountains. And I'm in the shadow of Mount Adams, which is a 4,000 meter snow capped, lovely mountain. And it's a wonderful place to be quarantined. Oh, it sounds amazing. Sounds like idyllic, but it's lovely that technology can bring us together so that we can talk. So there's a couple of reasons that I've welcomed Seth to the podcast. First of all, really, I think it's just because Tuferki, as far as I'm concerned, are sort of one of the most established and sort of highly known brands of vegan food. And there's such an interesting history behind the story of the company. So I wanted to talk to Seth about that. And wrapping that all up, um, he's actually authored a new book called In Search of the Wild Turkey, the Tofurky Story. So what a journey you've been on, Seth. Would you like to tell the listeners a bit about where it all started? Yeah, sure. Well, for me, I guess the journey started in 1971 when I was in uh, the university in Ohio and I read a book called Diet for a Small Planet by Francis Moore LaPay, which was a groundbreaking book at the time. And it was the first book that really pointed out the inefficiencies of feeding 16 pounds of grain or whatever to an animal and then only getting a small amount of protein in return, like eight ounces or one pound or uh, something like that. So that made sense to me. I was a naturalist at the time and I was teaching kids about nature. And this made so much sense to me because I saw the farmlands in Ohio where I was going to school and croaching on the wildlands where the birds and the animals all lived. And I thought if we had a efficient way of producing food that was 16 times more efficient than the way we do it now, there'd be 16 times more space. Uh, it would take some of the pressure off of the environment and the habitat that was being lost. So that was really my first idea was the uh, environmental aspect. And secondly, I got a job teaching natural history to high school students in Tennessee. And I had been reading all about this vegan community that didn't really call itself a vegan community because then I know that the UK, Watson had invented the word vegan in I think 1945, but in the US, the term wasn't in use yet. You were a vegetarian, which meant you didn't eat meat, but you also ate maybe dairy products and eggs, or you were a pure vegetarian, which means you didn't eat any animal products at all. So what we called vegan today was called pure vegetarian back then. And so this community was a spiritual community, and there was 1,200 hippies living on 1,600 acres of land, and they were growing soybeans, and they didn't know what to do with them. So they started studying, and they'd go to the library, and they'd read all these books on soy products. And one of the soy products that they had read about was called tempeh. And I I was very interested in that. What caught my eye on the tempeh was they were saying, A, it's delicious and everybody loves it here on the farm. And B, it digests well. And so I was like, whoa, I got to try this product. So I drove over there one weekend and got some of this tempeh starter and brought it back. And I made a batch of tempeh the next weekend. I cooked the beans and I split the beans by rubbing them together with my hands because you need to take the hull off the soybean in order for the tempeh culture to get in and pre-digest the enzymes and proteins to make it so digestible. That's the secret of it. So then I put some of the magic starter culture on there and I put it in a pan. I put the beans out in the field. The next day I came back and I looked under the lid of the pan and there was this beautiful white mold had covered all the soybeans and it smelled like mushrooms and very fresh uh, scent. So 
I thought this looked great. But when I took it into my mates who were drinking beer at the cook shack, they weren't so sure that they were going to live if they ate this moldy soybean product. But because they had been drinking beer, their confidence was overly high and caution was thrown to the wind. And we ate this tempeh meal with sweet corn and okra and big slices of tomatoes. And just from the first bite, I was like, this is the best food I've ever eaten. And I felt so good afterwards. I mean, they all thought they might die, but I was like really <laughs> happy and to have a good tasting soy food that also felt good in my body. So that was really where I started making tempeh. And then I went back to Oregon, had another uh, four or five years of teaching, just kept making small batches of it for friends and family. And that was really the genesis of it until 1980, when I opened a little tempeh shop in a town near Portland, Oregon. And uh, I started delivering tempeh. I, I could make 100 pounds of tempeh a night. And I would rent, I rented out the kitchen from the local natural food store. And I would come in there at four o'clock in the afternoon. And by midnight, I had made a batch of tempeh and it was all in the incubator. And the next day at four o'clock, I'd come back and I'd harvest it. That was really the, the start of the whole Tofurky project was making tempeh. December 1st, 1980, I signed up as a business in the state of Oregon. And on Christmas that year, I went back to see my aunt and stay with her in Minnesota, which is a more conservative state than Oregon. And I sat there one evening over some of her amazing apple pie, and I told her all about my plans to be in business, which was really new to me because I didn't know anything about business. And I was going to make this product low on the food chain, plant-based protein for the world. And she sat me down and she just grabbed me at one point and she said, Seth, Seth, look at me, look at me. This is a very bad idea. <laughs> this is a meat eating country and it's always going to be a meat eating country. And you should not, nobody's going to want to eat these moldy soybeans of yours. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, uh, thanks, Aunt Rosie, for the nice <laughs> words, but I think I'm going to keep doing it, you know, which I'm, I'm glad I did. But, you know, for the first nine years, it began to look like she was right because, you know, I, I didn't really make much money. I, I was only living on $300 U.S. dollars a month. So very poor, but the dream kept growing. And uh, those were, were actually pretty thrilling, happy years. They weren't, I was failing on a financial sense, but I was happy to be on this mission of bringing the tempeh to America. Oh, it's just a, a fascinating story. So what happened? What was the turning point? Yeah, so it was only two months of working in the night kitchen that I got a call from a wholesaler who said, we want your tempeh and we want 400 kilos a week. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I can't do that here. I'm going to have to find a bigger space. So I looked all around. I was lucky enough to find an old abandoned elementary school that was about an hour and a half drive from Portland, Oregon, where my market was. And I convinced the local school board to rent me this big building. It was perfect. It had a commercial kitchen. It had uh, stainless steel sinks and uh, an exhaust hood and tables and even a room to incubate the tempeh. So it was a great spot, and I was able to rent it out for $150 a month, which was very cheap. I worked there for the 10 years and grew the business. I kept feeling like a failure, you know. I was just so stupid in the ways of business. I didn't know enough about keeping good bookkeeping or accounting and all the skills, marketing, sales. So I had to learn all that. 
you know, so I look at those first 15 years really as my business school. What I learned after 14 years was I'm a failure (laughs) And, and this is like not working out. I mean, I'm wondering what I should do differently. I decided, well, people seem to like tofu more because tofu was much more widely known as it is today. But I was I was messing around with with tofu, and one day I went to my friend who had a small sandwich shop. I said, Hans, what are you making? And he said, I'm making a stuffed tofu roast for Thanksgiving holiday, which, you know, Thanksgiving in the U.S. is the big food holiday, and most people eat uh, turkey then. And if you didn't eat turkey, which I didn't, you know, there was a problem. And I had tried making all these terrible Thanksgiving <laughs> vegetarian options. I tried a seitan roast that you couldn't cut with a chainsaw. It was just so <laughs> tough. There was a stuffed pumpkin with all these lovely vegetables and rice in there that collapsed in the oven. Big mess. Uh, when I saw Hans making this stuffed tofu roast, I was like, whoa, this looks really good. And I bought one. And I tasted it and it was delicious. So I said, you know, maybe there's a a business here. And so um, I pivoted from all tempeh to a tempeh uh, slash tofu company. And and it was really Tofurky that changed my fortunes and the fortunes of the company from just a small regional supplier to a national and then international supplier. And that was 1995 when... We sold the first uh, 800 Tofurky roasts at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Oh, it's amazing. How many do you sell now then per year? Well, we will sell on the roast, we'll probably sell uh, half a million or more a year. We've, we've surpassed the 5 million number in the the roast several years ago, so you know, it's just been a, a great worldwide phenomenon and, and, a, and a product. And it's one of my favorite um, Tofurky products. What I wanted to say, actually, is that your story and the growth of what you've done, it sort of runs a parallel to actually the growth of vegetarian and veganism as a lifestyle itself, because now it's sort of so much more popular than ever. Um, it must feel really different for you now. Are things really changed so much and do you feel that change in the U.S. as we do in the U.K.? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I, uh, you're you're absolutely right. You know that the, the growth of tofurkey parallels the growth of plant-based foods. You know, just to give you an example, in 1980, you could could not find tofu or tempeh or any plant-based product in the store except for, of course, you know, veggies and grains. The only place you could buy tofu was in the natural food stores. And and then, you know, it, it gradually grew. And, you know, Tofurky products were in 1995 and beyond. They uh, were some of the early products that the supermarkets would buy. After you could get past you know, the buyers, the buyers in the supermarket would see the name Tofurky and they'd laugh and they'd go, this is a, a joke or a product, right? It would be hard to convince them to get it in. But once it got on the shelf, they were like, oh my God, we got to get more of this because customers got the name right away, Tofu Turkey. And so that was a trailblazing product in a lot of the Walmarts and Safeways and Kroger or the big chain grocery stores. Um, back then. But now, you know, what we're seeing over here is like five years ago, the refrigerated plant-based meat alternative space in the supermarkets was growing at about an average of 5% a year, which is doesn't sound like much, but to the grocery industry, it is because the stores, all food in the grocery stores sells at about uh, a growth rate of about 2% a year. So if they see a category that is selling over twice as fast as the 
other categories, they go, this is a hot category. So they, you know, it was kicking along and doing well, but then uh, right around 2017, 2018, we started to see a big growth in the plant-based foods. And it's what we call a hockey stick growth. It just goes up mm. like that all of a sudden. And you would buy the the data, the sales data, and then it would be, it wouldn't be 5%, it would be 20%. And then you'd look at it, it would be 40%. And then it would be 50. It would just going on and on. Last week, I got the recent most recent sales data for this category. What do you think the growth rate was? Oh, I don't know. So was it like 100%? 128% growth really? over the past year, which is just staggering. You know, the reason why it's so uh, growing so much, and I, I don't have the number in the UK or Europe, but I, I would imagine it might be similar. And it's just that the taste and texture of these products has improved so much since 1980 or even 1995 that um, that's why why people have said, oh, I could eat this. This is good. I mean, it's not, you know, people want to enjoy their food. So I think taste is, is really driving this um, great movement that we're seeing right now because there's all these great products. Yeah, well, it must leave you with a warm feeling that all those years ago, you were actually right, weren't you? Yeah, I, I was a little bit ahead of things, but uh, no, it it was. I mean, I don't regret being uh, one of the first players in there for sure. I think now, too, is such a great time for people, entrepreneurs and startup businesses to jump into this category because there's a lot of uh, room for growth right now, which is why we want all of the good tasting plant-based products to succeed. You know, we don't look at it as competition. We look at it as the tide that floats all boats. And plus, you know, we want to see a vegan world and it's a bigger job veganizing this world than any one brand can do. So mm -hmm. we need everybody's help. Uh, everybody all hands on deck we have an emergency what a fantastic story so i suppose i'd like to ask you seth what are your thoughts on the coronavirus pandemic and how's that been affecting you this pandemic has been so punishing to so many people in so many ways and it is just impacting so much the deeper the crisis the deeper the opportunity for change i think i really think that connecting the dots from this pandemic will happen. And I think it'll, it'll, we'll see a boost coming out of this um, towards plant-based and uh, who knows, cellular, you know, clean meat kind of initiatives too might uh, also play a part, but we've got to get out of this despicable, cruel and inefficient way that we raise uh, protein right now. So I think that that will happen. Um, I can't thank you enough, Seth, for joining us all the way from the United States. So wishing you well and best of luck with the book. Keep fighting on. Thank you so much for having me on. Seth's book, In Search of the Wild Turkey, is available to buy from Amazon and online from other sellers from 24 dollars 